Okay, good afternoon or good morning, depending on what time zone you're in. Welcome to this uh, webinar on the ANS, and I'll explain why it's ANS uh, in a minute, um, Trusted Data Repository Program. My name's Andrew Trelaw. Um, I work for ANS, and I was responsible for the Trusted Data Repository Program itself. So I'm going to start by providing a bit of context for the program and an overview of, very high level overview of Core Trust Seal. We then have um, three case studies. These were three projects that we funded. Uh, one from CSIRO, one from the National Imaging Facility and one from the Australian Data Archive. Uh, and I'll explain why we picked those and the different perspectives they provide. And then we have a slightly more freewheeling Q&A session at the end. So there should be plenty of time for you to um, ask any questions that you have. Um, Trusted Data Repositories was a program that ANS funded in its 2016-17 annual business plan. Now 2016-17 seems like a very long time ago now. Uh, and a number of these projects, for reasons that they will explain, ran after the end of the 2016-17 financial year. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we're talking about them now. It also means that this was a program that we started when ANS and Nectar and RDS were largely separate activities. Um, since that time, ANS, Nectar and RDS have been progressively aligning what they do. Our 2017-18 activities, um, which are of course still running, are being undertaken under an integrated business plan. And so while it seems slightly strange to be talking about an ANS only program, for me at least, uh, it is very much something that's been embraced by RDS and Nectar. So the, this overall trust agenda is very much something that is reflected in the 2017-18 business plan um, and is tied into a wider concern around research quality and trustedness. So please see this as entirely consistent with what the three projects as they come together care about, even though it started under an ANS only umbrella. I was trying to think about the best way to provide some context for the concern with trustedness. And I decided to um, go back, not to beer, although I, the beer is relevant, but go back to an article that was very formative for me in the early 90s, uh, written by a guy called John Perry Barlow, who in fact died last month. So he was a, a guy who was, among other things, a lyricist for the band The Grateful Dead, but was one of the early thinkers around uh, intellectual property and ideas and wrote a very influential article called the, uh, the Economy of Ideas, subtitled Everything You Know About Intellectual Property is Wrong, where among other things, he distinguished between the container and the contents. And so the way I want us to think about trust for the purposes of this seminar is to distinguish between the contents of a repository and the repository itself. Uh, and so, what we all want is we want contents, in this case, something that we can consume without fear. And one of the ways that we are happy to, in this case, drink from this delightful glass of beer is by looking at the container. And so the container has some characteristics that make the contents more trustworthy. One of the characteristics Oh, I hadn't actually thought about this joke until now. One of the characteristics is the seal on top of the, uh, the container in this case. You can see that the beer bottle has not been unsealed. And so we're prepared to believe that uh, it hasn't been tampered with between the brewery and getting poured. And another of the elements of the trust that we might have in this particular beer is the label on the bottle. So we look at this and we say, ah, yes, I've heard of Batemans, if I think I think is what that says. Um, I've heard of Batemans. They produce trustworthy beer. Uh, there might be more information on the back. It might say brewed in somewhere. Um, so there's a, a there's some brand information associated with, with the container that leads us to trust it more. And there may even be some provenance information um, about how the beer was produced. 
uh, where the ingredients came from, um, and so on. So the distinction that I want you to, to take out of this image is not, hmm, it's lunchtime, I'm really, I'd really like a beer now, but that distinction between container and contents. And in fact, the ANS Trusted Data Repository projects were focused on the container. We had a separate set of projects called Trusted Research Outputs, which were focused much more around the process of producing the outputs and the provenance associated with producing the outputs. In this webinar, we want to focus on the container, the Trusted Data Repository projects. So we selected a small number of pilot projects, which were deliberately designed to cover a, as wide a range of settings as possible. So they covered a range of disciplines, um, human and non-human imaging in the case of NIF, um, social sciences, mostly quantitative social sciences in the case of ADA, um, water and a number of other physical sciences in the case of CSIRO, a number of different organisational settings, um, in some cases universities, in some cases a national archive, in some cases a research institution, and a number of different provision models. And you'll hear more about each of those in the case studies. And the point was to try and get information about what it takes to implement a trusted data repository. Part of what we were doing in the program was we're saying, look, we'd like you to use this, what was then called the data seal of approval, now called the core trust seal certification as the um, approach to follow to determine whether or not this was a trusted data repository. And so for those of you that are unfamiliar with core trust seal, this started out as a thing called the data seal of approval and was one of a number of certification schemes. If you look at the bottom of this slide, um, originally it was part of a, a three level hierarchy. So the simplest was data seal of approval. Next level up was a, um, a German standard, uh, which was um, looking at standardization of digital resources and the most uh, advanced level was the thing that some of you may have heard of called the TRAC criteria or ISO 16363. Uh, and what happened was that the world um, data system, WDS, worked with the Research Data Alliance via a working group on repository audit and certification, took the DUNS data seal of approval, um, tweaked it a bit, added some additional questions, and essentially agreed on this as what was for a while called the RDA WDS criteria, and then uh, just recently has morphed into an organization called Core Trust Seal. So there is now an organization called coretrustseal.org, uh, which is taken over responsibility for this certification program. It's relatively straightforward at the high level. There are 16 criteria that you use to assess your repository. Some of these are around your organization and the characteristics of your organization. Some of these are around the way your repository does digital object management. Um, and you have varying levels of compliance uh, possible for a number of these criteria. So you can assess how well you're doing. In that respect, it's a little bit like a, uh, a maturity model assessment. The thing I want to stress before we get into the case studies is that this is not just technology. And in fact, the technology is almost the least important bit. Uh, a lot of it is to do around the organizational processes and the kind of organization that's standing behind this um, trusted data repository. You can use the criteria to do a self-assessment and you hear a number of the presenters talk about a self-assessment or you can then submit that assessment for certification. So external reviewers will look at that and maybe come back and ask some questions and you would then get a core trust seal tick uh, which will last three years and there's a business model that sits behind that. You have to pay for that. But you can of course just do the self-assessment um, as an exercise for yourself at zero cost. So there's more information there and links to the, the criteria, but if you go to coretrustseal.org, that will be enough. 
So that's all I really wanted to provide by way of introduction. What I'd now like to do is pass to the first of our presenters. So the first of our presenters is uh, Michaela Lauren, Laurie, sorry, Lawrence, my apologies, Michaela, who would like to talk to us about the sorrow experience in working with this uh, approach. Okay, so um, today I'm just going to talk about um, CSIRO's um, Trusted Data Repository project. Um, so I'll go through the aims of the project, um, some background about the data access portal, uh, the requirements for self-assessment as a TDR, gathering the evidence, applying for certification and also another aspect of our project was um, looking into hosting externally owned data. Um, the aims of um, the Trusted Data Repository project was to investigate certifying the data access portal as a trusted data repository, um, to develop a plan to implement changes to policies and procedures to support CSIRO business requirements and certification to develop a plan to implement systems changes that may be required to the DAP infrastructure, to engage with external entities to host externally owned data as a test case and to prepare an application for certification. Um, this is um, our data access portal. Um, so just a bit of background information of the repository um, and this will provide some of the context that relates to the first section of the application. So the data access portal is currently an institutional repository and um, when we submitted our application, that's what we submitted our application as. Deposit is by self-service and is accessible to CSIRO staff using their institutional username and login. Um, we have approximately 2,100 publicly available collections and storage um, of the data is over one petabyte. The subject matter includes a broad range of sciences with 17 of the 22 fields of research codes represented. The software and storage infrastructure of the DAP, which is um, what we term our data access portal, are developed and managed by CSIRO Information Management and Technology. We have a data deposit checklist, which ensures depositors consider key quality and legal issues prior to, to, sorry, prior to deposit. A science leader then approves the collection after assessing it for quality and legal issues. The, offer, the repository, um, we offer a few different curation levels based on depositor needs. So the content can be distributed as deposited. Um, we may offer some basic curation, brief checking or addition of basic metadata or enhanced curation, such as conversion to new formats. The designated community or data users of the data access portal are researchers, industry, policy makers, general public and students. The data users can download the majority of collections without a user login and a smaller number of collections will require registration to access the files. So the requirements for self-assessment as a TDR. So when we um, went through um, the process to help with understanding the 16 requirements of the self-assessment, we read other organisations' applications and considered the evidence they had used. Um, applications with the core trust seal are now open with certified repository applications available on their website. Um, applications that were useful to us in reading were Dan, um, as they're part of the Secretariat of the Course Trust Seal and have been involved in developing the requirements and also the UK Data Archive. They had a well-organised application with de detailed evidence. To help with the next step of gathering and determining what evidence to use for CSIRO, an analysis was undertaken of the types of evidence used in a few of the published applications. 
We've included a list of references we use to inform our understanding of the requirements in the appendix of our report to ANS. This will be published on their website. There also is a useful extended guidance document and webinar available on the Core Trust Seal website that discusses the requirements and reviewers' expectations. Um, gathering the evidence. Um, the certifying body have a preference for evidence that is public and we found this a major challenge. In this table are some examples of the evidence we used for the first part of the requirements which were organisational related um, from requirement one to six. It gives an idea of new evidence we developed such as uh, the mission statement also the difficulty with providing publicly available evidence. It also provides information about the departments we consulted for expert guidance with our, within our organisation, such as legal, business development and staff from within our own information and technology, um, information management and t technology department. We have attempted to overcome the challenge with providing public evidence with the development of collection development principles, preservation principles, and an update of the data management live guide. These provide a summary of the processes for requirements for um, from seven to 16, which cover digital object management and technology. These public documents are available from the CIRO DAP help page. So the next, um, what stage are we up to with applying for certification? Um, so the data seal of approval ceased applications in October 2017 and we missed this deadline. Um, however, our application was submitted with the core trust seal in uh, February 2018 as part of their soft launch to test their system. Um, processing of our application will begin when the core trust seal legal entity is finalised. So we're currently waiting to pay the administration fee of a thousand euro. And then our um, application will be processed. Uh, we found getting an account for the application management tool gave access to a staff member who promptly answered our questions. And a word of warning, once an application is submitted, it is locked. However, we found the helpful staff member could amend a small error we had made. Um, one aspect of our project looked at investigating um, policies, procedures and system changes to host externally owned data. So why was this part of our strategy? Um, as a reach as a, an organisation, we understand the value of new research possibilities in drawing together research data produced by organisations beyond CSIRO and across the research community. Also, researchers from our land and water business unit are interested in investigating a trusted repository for water research data. This vision is to bring together nationally significant data from a wide range of organisations for the benefit of industry policy and research. So what did we implement as part of this part of the project? Um, we defined the scope for accepting data in the collection development principles. For example, data should be aligned with CSIRO's function as set out in section nine of the science and Research Industry Act 1949. Terms and conditions were developed into an agreement to be signed by the depositing organisation called the Data Deposit Conditions. Some example of the terms and conditions include that data is free from embargo, it has not previously been published with a DOI, data is owned by the depositing organisation, data complies with ethics, privacy, confidentiality, contractual licensing and copyright obligations, and data will have a CC BY license applied. Um, a data deposit form was developed from, for the data depositor to provide metadata. We developed some procedures for depositing externally owned data. 
The DAP is a self-service repository with access to deposit by SIRO staff only. So the research data service will liaise with external data owners to facilitate the deposit of data. Then a science um, CSIRO science leader with domain knowledge of the data will be the approver of the collection. This is part of the risk management framework that all public data collections in the DAP are subject to. It involves a check of the data quality and legal issues prior to publishing. So some future enhancements um, to the DAP include the ability to customise a collection landing page such, such as the addition of logos for external organisations. Um, automation of the data deposit conditions within the existing DAP software and to develop a self-serve deposit interface for external organisations. We found that this um, project had some immediate benefits for us, um, such as when applying for a recommended repository status with journal publishers and funders, um, we've found that we had information ready to use to meet those requirements. And we've also had inquiries from researchers regarding publishing externally owned data and we have now have a response with policies and procedures in place. So thank you. Um, and there was a lot of people involved in this um, project within CSIRO, um, too many to list, um, but a thank you to all of them as well. Okay, um, so uh, next, uh, another Andrew, Andrew Maynard, uh, to talk about the NIF experience. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to talk about National Trusted Data Repositories for the National Imaging Facility. Uh, so my name's Andrew Maynard, I'm a NIF Informatics Fellow uh, at the Centre for Microscopy Characterisation Analysis at the University of Western Australia. So very quickly, what is NIF? Uh, the Australian National Imaging Facility is a $130 million project providing state-of-the-art imaging capability of animals, plants and materials for the Australian research community. A little map there to the right shows the various nodes of the National Imaging Facility around the country. Now, why is NIF interested in trusted data repositories? Well, the imaging equipment such as MRI, PET, CT scanners are capable of producing vast amounts of valuable research data. So we're interested in maximising those research outcomes and to do so, uh, the data must be stored securely and must have its uh, quality verified and should be accessible to the wider research community. From the core trust seal point of view, why trusted data repositories? Well, firstly, to be able to share data. Secondly, to preserve the initial investment in collecting that data. Thirdly, to ensure that the data remain useful and meaningful into the future. And the last one, importantly, is that funding authorities are increasingly uh, requiring continued access to data that's produced by projects they fund. All right, now I want to talk specifically about the NIF, RDS, ANS Trusted Data Repositories project, officially titled Delivering Durable, Reliable, High Quality Image Data for the National Imaging Facility. Now, broad aim of the project uh, was to enhance quality, durability, and reliability of data that's generated by the NIF. Now, by quality, we mean the data, data has to be captured according to what we call the NIF agreed process. Durable means that the data has to have guaranteed availability for 10 years. And reliable means that the data has to be useful for future researchers. So it has to be stored in uh, one or more open data formats and with sufficient evidential metadata. So we know how it was created, what the state of the instrument was at the time of creation and so on. The NIF nodes involved with the University of Western Australia, University of Queensland, University of New South Wales and Monash University. And in the project, we limited our scope to MRI data, but essentially the results are generalizable to other modalities. And in fact, uh, we've already progressed to uh, micro CT. So key outcomes from the project include the NIF agreed process to obtain trusted data from NIF instruments. I'll talk more about that shortly. Uh, the second is requirements necessary and sufficient for a basic NIF trusted data repository service. 
The third were exemplary, repos exemplary repository services across all four participating nodes. And then the last one were self-assessments against the core trustworthy data repositories requirements from Core Trust Seal. So the NIF agreed process for acquiring high quality data. This essentially lists requirements that have to be satisfied to obtain high quality data, which we call NIF certified data, that's then suitable for ingestion in a NIF trusted data repository service. We mandate that repository data must be organised by project ID because project IDs will persist with time, whereas user IDs don't. Users come and go. Now, to be NIF certified, the data must have been acquired on a NIF compliant instrument. More about that shortly. It has to possess NIF minimal metadata, so that includes cross reference to relevant instrument quality control data. It has to include the native data generated by the instrument in proprietary format and include conversions to one or more open data formats. So the requirements for a NIF trusted data repository service, we uh, drew upon the core trust seal uh, requirements in the left column that you see there and additionally added some NIF requirements. So one of them you've seen already, the project ID requirement, but we also require an instrument ID uh, requirement. Uh, quality control requirement, authentication by Australian Access Federation requirement, interoperability, that is we should be able to uh, upload data from one repository to another, redeployability, it should be possible to deploy the uh, service from one NIF node to another, and a service requirement that essentially we have a help desk uh, responding to requests regarding the repository. So in a nutshell, if we have a look at this diagram, if we can concentrate on the right hand side, uh, if we have, uh, we've got the four sites, UWA, UQ, UNSW and Monash. So TrueDAT at that particular site represents the trusted data repository. Login is via the Australian Access Federation. So that means on any of the sites, it will direct you back to your institutional login page and use institutional credentials. As I mentioned before, data sets are organized by project ID. A data set is associated with an instrument and provided the NIF agreed process has been uh, Followed then a NIF certification flag uh, indicating that it is certified is also included with the data set. And the repository has a record for the instrument. The instrument itself is linked to another special project called the Quality Control Project uh, and also a handle to a record in Research Data Australia. So looking at the bottom of the screen, you can see Research Data Australia is a data and service discovery portal pro provided by ANS. So we put into that uh, an instrument description, that's both hardware and software, and uh, there's a unique handle to that record. If we look at top left now, at the instrument PC or client PC, uh, data is uploaded according to the NIF agreed process. So the top box above NIF agreed process, the user data set has to have minimal metadata. That's the project ID, instrument ID, date and time, the data was acquired, implicit metadata that's in the proprietary data, the native data from the instrument and conversions to one or more open data formats. Uh, the instrument operator can also upload uh, data to the quality control project, which includes uh, the quality, stand quality control standard operating procedure, which of course can be updated over time, and quality control data. So what this means is that when a user uploads data to the repository, there's an automatic link to the quality control project, and so it's possible to know the state of the instrument at the time that the data was acquired. This is what the portal looks looks like for TrueDAT at UWA. Uh, so we have uh, based this on the MyTardis platform, which uh, originated at Monash uh, with several extensions developed during the project. And we use uh, Docker technology to be able to easily deploy at different sites. So this allows easy instrument integration, simple data sharing and user controlled publishing of data sets. Okay, now I come to the comparison uh, of all the self-assessments against the core trust seal uh, requirements. So all four sites did their own self-assessments for their respective repositories. Uh, and what we can see here in this table, so this shows the first eight uh, such requirements, is that essentially we uh, independently uh, arrived at the a fairly, fairly similar level of assessment, except for the cases there where we marked in blue. And uh, so the third one, we talk about continuity of access. Uh, so uh, Monash here believed that uh, at this point in time that that was not uh, assured. 
whereas the other three sites did. So I should point out this self-assessment is a statement of the reality, the situation at the point in time that the self-assessment was completed. Uh, and then there was a difference as well at uh, row four, which is uh, requirement four, confidentiality, confidentiality and ethics. Monash uh, have this fully implemented, uh, whereas the other three sites are in various stages of, of getting this to be implemented. And then the other differences uh, with the remaining requirements, uh, some differences with respect to data storage, uh, documented storage procedures, uh, workflows, and data discovery and uh, identification. Post-funding, so the project hasn't finished just because the funding has finished, so we intend to maintain the services for 10 years now, and we uh, plan to meet quarterly uh, to make sure that this happens. We are integrating additional instruments. As I said, we're uh, adding uh, uh, micro CT instruments at the moment. Uh, we will create a project web portal. So we have a single landing page for all these trusted data repository services. We're planning new national and international service deployments, including one in Turku, Finland. Uh, we're refining and improving the uh, trusted data repository portal. And we intend uh, progressing the to core trust seal certification. So very quickly, benefits of the NIF trusted data repository services for NIF users in the broader community means reliable, durable access to data, improved reliability of research outputs and provenance associated with it, making NIF data more fair, easier linkages between publications and data and stronger research partnerships. For NIF, it means improved data quality, improved international reputation, ability to run multi-centre trials, and for the various research institutions, enhanced reputation management, a means by which to comply with the draft code for responsible research, and enhanced ability to engage in multi-centre imaging research projects. And with that, uh, I thank you. Uh, and I list on the page here the various project leads at the various nodes. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Andrew Maynard. Um... So that's two quite different perspectives on trusted data repositories. The third perspective comes from uh, Heather Leesaw and Steve McGecken from the Australian Data Archive. We're okay, the Australian Data Archive, which is a, a social science research data archive. Um, and our mission is to be a national service for the collection and preservation of digital research data and to make these available to academics, government and other researchers. Uh, we hold about 5,000 data sets in over 1,500 studies um, of all areas of social science from social attitudes, surveys, censuses, aggregate statistics, administrative data, and many other sources, both qualitative and quantitative. Our data holdings are sourced from academics, government, and private sector. So we undertook the process with ANS. Um, as part of the trusted repositories. We originally started um, under the data seal of approval before they had actually combined fully with the World Data Service or systems. Um, so originally we were the um, DSA and then we became the DSA WDS. When we found out that they were moving to the core trust seal, we delayed our implementation of which guidelines to take. Um, we officially started the DSA WDS in March of 2017 and submitted our application in April of 2017. We were due to have a review from our reviewers in May, but it didn't actually arrive until August. Um, then we made our corrections to this. We sent it back in and then we got another um, aspect of corrections, did the other round of corrections and submitted and finalized in February of 2018. So slightly less than a year's uh, length of process, but we are a core trust seal uh, repository now. We did use the November 2016 WDS, uh, DSA-WDS guidelines, um, which weren't, weren't as detailed as what is given in the core trust seal, and there were no people to look at for reference, as in Michaela had said she looked at others for reference. There was no one to look at for reference for this new core trust seal. Um, so we kind of 
flew from what people had done in the DSA, WDS, and uh, flew blind for a bit. So when we went through the process, which was a very useful process for self-assessment, we identified four of the guidelines, which we set at a level three, which is the implementation phase of process, which were data integrity and authenticity, the guideline 10, which was preservation and planning, guideline 15, which was technical infrastructure, and guideline 16. Later in assessment with one of our reviewers, we also changed guideline nine, which is documented storage, down to a level three. Everything else we had set at a level four for our repository. Um, our repository has been around for about 35 years, um, coming up on 40 years, so we do have quite a few procedures in, in place. So some of the challenges that we found doing the core trust seal process. Um, when we initially undertook it, there was no recommendation of what a minimum requirement would be for any of the guidelines. So we didn't know if we'd set it at a three, if that meant we wouldn't be able to get a core trust seal or not. Um, or if it's if you set it at a one, can you still get a core trust seal? Um, there doesn't seem to be a minimum requirement that we have ever found. Um, the extended guidelines do detail things a little bit better nowadays uh, for those who are undertaking it in the future. And we weren't sure if you had to respond to every aspect of all of the sub questions in a guideline or just to the overall arching guideline. We also found that there was a complex interplay between the relevant documents required for a guideline and those for other guidelines so that one document may respond to up to four different guidelines or it may respond to only one guideline. Um, and also we found it difficult for providing evidence from documents which were not in the public domain. Like the other two, we had to go through our own websites and find out what we did have forward facing, what we had internally facing, and which aspects of those we feel we can now put into an outward facing um, website or wiki page. Um, there should be, all aspects should be um, outward facing, but if things have to be inward facing, there seems to be some um, basis that the core trust seal can deal with that. Um, the assessors did not indicate in our original um, guidelines that you had to have a timeline for things that were in process. The new guidelines do state that you have to list a guideline of when you plan to have your implementation in place by. So we had to add that in our final version of when we planned to have these items forward facing and our new website uh, up and running. And we had to come up, we had no idea when we originally started the process what the process entailed and what time frames it was going to take. Uh, we were unclear if it was going to take a few months or a year. It ended up taking us a year, but the core trust seal does seem to be coming along as an organization much better so that timelines should move a bit quicker now. So from our experience, um, we found that doing as Michaela and Andrea had done, going through and finding out what is in the public domain already and what can safely be put into the public domain is a, a good first step for any repository undertaking the core trust seal. Um, and how to cite the items which are out of the public domain in the private elements um, is still an area of question uh, which the core trust seal is dealing with. We also would like to know how to deal with items that are out of our direct control, such as funding models, um, infrastructure and governance, being a part of a larger university, or as CSIRO, part of a governmental body, um, and Andrew being parts of multiple institutions. How do you fit into their governance models? How do you fit into the infrastructure? And how is this relayed to the core trust seal? Um, with these complexities. Also, the risk management section of the core trust seal we found a bit difficult because they kept referencing almost ISO standard um, requirements. And to undertake an ISO standard for a risk assessment to do a base core trust seal uh, seemed a bit overkill for us. 
So finding some risk management standards that are free and in the public domain um, would be very useful. And we've actually answered the final one, which is the guidelines are freely available for self-assessment without paying to obtain the seal. Um, you can just undertake the core trust deal as a self-assessment for your repository. So you can define what your repository is, where your boundaries are, um, and undertake the assessment. So in the Australian context, um, these aren't necessarily only in the Australian context. We did find that they relate to other repositories worldwide, but the complexity of how institutions and repositories, one institution may encompass multiple repositories or one repository may encompass multiple institutions and how this affects your governance, your funding, your security and all of those aspects, as well as things that are in the national framework. So things that are involved in our national roadmaps, um, how these play into the core trust seal and how they're also out of the control of the individual repositories. Um, infrastructure frameworks, infrastructure that is provided by your um, host institution and the government frameworks of host institutions, which are not easily explainable in a core trust seal. Um, so these are not necessarily, as I said, Australian specific, but more to the repository sector because the repository sector is a very varied um, sector with multiple institutions, multiple repositories playing different roles. So, okay, thank you. Um, Steve and Heather. Um, so we've now uh, heard from three separate uh, experiences of engaging with trusted data repositories in the core trust seal and we now have 15 minutes or so for questions. Um, the first question is from Nick who says that they got data seal of approval in 2012, so very early on. Uh, is there any advantage in going through the WDS process? Um, would any of the three panelists like to weigh in on that one? Well, perhaps I'll take that one, Andrew. Um, Thanks, Steve. I, my, my sense would be probably, I mean, the the, the DSA the, yeah, is a sort of a three-year certification in and of itself. Um, so it's a question, I mean, from the point of view of being ongoing certification, I suppose there's, you know, there's a, a consideration there. What I would say to you, um, having been through, say we were familiar with the DSA in its original version uh, and what it morphed into in the core trust seal, um, there is probably a heavier um, expectation on some of the risk management and preservation requirements than there was in the past. Uh, and the, the emphasis has, sh has shifted somewhat, um, I would say. The other point I would probably make is that the, um, the review process itself. I mean, we we came to say we were kind of flying blind, as, as, as Heather pointed out. The ex, our experience is probably not reflective of everyone as a whole. I think the core trust seal organisation itself was developing, uh, and the reviewing that was going on um, probably re the, the reviews themselves are probably a bit different as they brought together what was the, the data seal of approval was a social science standard to, to begin with. Um, and you know, and into the humanities uh, as Nick's done as well. Um, the it has, I think, the WDS side of this is more the physical and life, um, physical sciences in particular, some of the earth sciences. Um, so that there's probably a shift in emphasis there. Um, I think it would be a good experience, um, but it might be a bit different from what you what you went through in the DSA experience. Was probably how I, you know, reflect on that. Okay, thanks, Steve. Um, comments from either of the presenters, if you want to weigh in on that. Okay, no, so it looks like a no. Um, maybe if I could ask a, a question that builds on um, that question from Nick and Steve's answer. So under Core Trust Seal, the idea is that you would apply for certification, you would get certification, that certification would run for three years. I know that they've talked about a, a sort of a lightweight recertification down the track um, if you want to get recertified in three years time. Would, would any of the presenters like to comment on the question of the time length 
for the certification or rather the expiry time for certification time and whether that is um, a reasonable thing to do is is it in your view does it seem sensible that your certification would slowly evaporate over a three-year period and that there'd be value in applying again in three years time anyone want to uh I guess Touch I might check in there and say okay. um, the amount of effort, I guess, in getting the original certification uh, through, uh, I, I'd say it'd be worth it to keep this going to the future. And it should be, a, you know, three years would seem reasonable and it should be a fairly lightweight exercise to, to get that recertification. That's having uh, not yet <laughs> achieved uh, certification first time around. I, I would say there, Andrew, I think three years is about the right sort of cycle as well, so long as the the certification process itself, um, the time frame shortens. Um, so our as our application was for April 2017, our certification was in February 2018, uh, our certification will end in the December 2019. Um, so I, I think the cycle is right given the context of what the, the content is, but I say, so and, and so this is, I think, partly a function of the organisation itself um, evolving and 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 um, sorting itself out. Uh, but the, the the process itself has to speed up somewhat in order to make that three year cycle an appropriate one. Um, I think that's the right time frame, but they have to speed up the process. Yep, that makes um, sense. And I, sorry, go on. I believe that yeah, as soon as you do have most of your documents together. Um, and you know which ones need to evolve, um, it, the recertification should go a bit quicker because you can just um, copy and paste pretty much and iterate what new developments have happened to your, your institution or your repository in that time. Yep, that makes sense. So as in, as in most new things that one does, the, the first time is a bit painful and then it, uh, it gets easier. Uh, Two questions from Carmela. Um, the first question is, what is Anne's long-term plan to include university repositories, to have all the university repositories meet the core trust seal? Um, so that is, a, that is an interesting combination of issues there. Um, firstly, it would now be Anne's Nectar RDS as we continue to merge towards a new organisation. Uh, and the Anne's Nectar RDS is not really in a position to require university repositories to do anything. Um, University repositories will apply for Core Trust Seal if they see value in doing it themselves. Um, in the case of the, the projects that presented here, we provided some funding to help ADA and NIF and CSIRO do something, but something they really wanted to do anyway. So I don't think that, uh, yeah, I think it's going to depend on the drivers for the individual repositories as to whether they see value in this. Um, and then the second question uh, was on the duration of the the data to be preserved. Um, Carmela's comment there was 10 years of data preservation seems like it's a relatively short period of time, especially in the case of clinical trials. Um, I'll leave it to the, the three presenters to, to comment on that, but I would just say that I suspect the 10 years is a consensus um, number and is not a you have to throw it away after 10 years number, it's a at least that number. Uh, I'm pretty sure the NH and MRC Australian Code for Responsible Conduct of Research says either 7 or 10, um, so it's not inconsistent with that. But would any of the presenters like to weigh in on the subject of 10 years before I move to the next question? So I might uh, answer first if I can. So I, I think you're right, uh, NHMRC, ARC requirements for, for seven years uh, for retaining data. The, the figure of 10 was uh, essentially in the original research proposal was something reasonable each uh, of the NIF nodes and, and their uh, associated institutions were happy to support, but that doesn't mean we won't support beyond the 10 year period. That was just uh, something uh, in consensus we agreed that collectively we, we could do to ensure. Mm -hmm. 10 years is a long time to guarantee uh, services running, uh, uh, but the plan at each of the nodes is that we would continue to the future. The 10 years is uh, 
uh, uh, proof of concept that we can indeed do this over a long period of time. Yep. Uh, in the case of NIF, this, this was establishing some new repository services, so that's been a challenge uh, unto itself and, and guaranteeing 10 years of uh, running service uh, is, is no mean feat. Yeah, 10 years seems like a long time. Well, I say, Andrew. Andrew. It's Graham, Graham Holly here, who is, <clears throat> who is the lead for that, the NIF Trusted Data Repository. And I think one of the things we need to recognise is that over 10 years, the nature of repository is going to change. We don't know where we're going to be storing data in 10 years. So for the institutions to guarantee more than 10 years at, the, at this point in time is going to be difficult. National Imaging Facility, as Andrew has already said, is committed to providing mechanisms for data storage. But you know, we could in ten years, those repositories could be existing on Amazon or on on other um, publicly uh, domain services. So we we felt you know we wanted a commitment from the partners at the time we signed the contract that they would guarantee to maintain that for storage for that 10 years, but we're committed to looking for mechanisms beyond that to ensure, and then of course, then you've got to look at migration of data between those repositories, and that's an, an issue we'll have to address, but. Yep, yep, indeed. Um, and for the benefit of those people who are unfamiliar with the august presence of Graham Galloway, he is the uh, Director of the National Imaging Facility. Um, and Liz, just, on, just, just on that, can I can just make a quick comment, which is this sure. is one of the things that, that we were referencing at the end here, which actually creates the complexity um, of responding to the guidelines in terms of saying how long you, you know, you will maintain a service or how long, you know, um, you're, you're, you're making, potentially making commitments you can't realistically fulfil. Um, yep. And the in some ways, some of the expectations in the the seal um, needed to account for that, I think, a little bit more than they, they probably did is it's unrealistic for us to say that we, you know, you know, other than being able to say, look, we've been running for, you know, 35 years, we'll probably still be here in 10 years' time. But as I say, in terms of an commitment, um, you know, I can say the ANU will be here in 10 years' time um, I can, you know, or if I'm the National Archives, I can say that uh, there aren't many organisations who can actually make that make such claims, or all parts of organisations. So, yeah, and yeah. that's actually a, that's actually a really good point, Steve. That um, I think the 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 data seal of approval certainly came out of an in, environment where they the players involved at the time were largely national archives and they saw the world through that set of lenses you know we've been around forever we're going to be around forever um, trying to apply that as you move out into the wider data repository space it gets harder and harder to make those kinds of commitments yeah. um, i realize we're running close on time so i might just skip over uh, an observation and maybe finish with this question which is what did it cost in terms of human and non-human resource to get certification uh, did any of you try and add up how much time and effort you put into this, or did you choose not to because the number was just going to be too scary? Um, well, we can we can say in terms of human res well, um, one of the human resources in this room. Um, <laughs> so, so Heather, as I part of our funding was was say for Heather to contribute to that, um, and as I say that you were working a fair chunk of about nine months probably to, to put that together. Um, it was a you know, reasonable portion of my time as well. Um, you know, not, not that level, but probably you know, half a day a week for, for several months. Um, and um, bits and pieces of other parts of our, our organisation as well. There aren't too many non-human resources because we were certifying an existing um, uh, facility. Um, so, you know, realistically, it was a document gathering or creation exercise. Um, so it really was primarily staff time that was the involvement there. It was a little bit of development, development, but not much. Um, but I think the experience would be different in, you know, Andrew's case in particular, where you were developing a new service. So, yeah, you know, I can sort of reflect on to certify an existing service. It really is 
staff time. It depends on how good your documentation is already. And in that way, it actually is a useful exercise for that experience because it reminds you of what you haven't done. Um, so as I say, there is real value in that. But as I say, there is a yeah, there is a time time that's involved in that as well. Yep. All right. Thank you, um, Michaela. Is it possible for you to to respond to that? Yep. Um, yes. Certainly, we had. Um, similar um, commitment as um, the ADA. Um, we had um, myself and another um, data librarian working on this and um, then um, given that we were looking at hosting externally available data, we also had um, some of our researchers um, talking to external organisations as well. So um, however to cost um, time, um, is a difficult thing and also our um, uh, legal counsel also put in a significant time and effort into developing new procedures um, and policies for hosting externally owned data. Okay, thank you. And uh, Andrew Maynard, did you want to weigh in on that? Yes, so similar experiences. Uh, we had the challenge, I guess, of having four different sites. Uh, we had a project manager at each site and a little team around that project manager to uh, address some of these issues, talk to IT services, talk to library services to resolve some of the question. Then as the overall project manager, I, I was consulting with each of the other project managers and trying to uh, come to consensus and even talking to yourself, Andrew. Uh, to understand some of the questions and, and how to respond and I guess at the end of the day it was giving an honest response uh, with the best information you have at hand and that is an uh, the honest status of uh, your your uh, uh, how you've addressed each of the requirements yep all right thank you and I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there we're uh, we're over time my apologies to those people who have questions in the question panel that we haven't got to yet um, but my, in particular, my thanks to the presenters, to Michaela, to Heather, to Steve, to Andrew Manet and to Graham for weighing in. Um, thank you for sharing your experiences with us. I hope that's been a benefit to the community. Uh, and we look forward to seeing or hearing from some of you on our next webinar. Thank you all.